and welcome to Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. I'm so excited about today's guest, Dr. Abigail Favale. Abigail has had an incredible journey from an English professor whose focus was gender studies and feminist literary criticism to a Catholic conversion. Now, she teaches on topics related to women and gender from a Catholic perspective and is a professor at the McGrath Institute for Church Life at the University of Notre Dame. She recently wrote a book, The Genesis of Gender, a Christian Theory, which we discuss a lot in this episode. With her firsthand knowledge of how gender discussions are taking place in the academy and of Christian viewpoints, her voice adds a really fascinating perspective to today's broader gender debates. With no further ado, I hope you enjoy. Abigail, welcome. Much joy to have you on. Yeah, it's great to be here. So before we dive into kind of the meat of this, can you give us kind of an overview of how it is that you came to write this particular book? Sure. So currently I'm a professor at the University of Notre Dame, and I have a background in feminist studies and gender studies. Um, and when I began my studies in graduate school in the early 2000s, um, it was a very different terrain um, than it is now. And back then I I thought very differently than I do now. I had a pretty, I would I often call it like a postmodern kind of progressive mindset um, and really took on board um, feminist theory and a lot of gender theory that I learned. Um, but about, let's see, eight years ago now, I became Catholic and that changed my worldview, you might say, a little bit. And so now I'm still interested in these same questions, but I think about them from a different angle. And so a lot of my work, I try to bring my insider knowledge of feminist theory and gender theory um, to be able to clarify some of the confusion that's happening right now around um, the discussions of gender. And I still remain fascinated by it. I mean, even even as, as things get weirder, I get more interested. So. <laughs> so you open your book with this really interesting discussion of the book of Genesis and the opening passage of Genesis where God creates man and woman. And as you do that, you point out this distinction, which I think at first sounds really abstract, but I, I think is actually kind of the key to understanding um, the current discussions about gender. Um, this question of whether speech identifies reality or creates reality. So it seems a little bit abstract at the outset, but if you could talk to me, I guess, on the one hand about Genesis's view on that question, and then how our view of that has evolved. Like, at what point did we stop kind of agreeing with the Genesis view on that question? Yeah, so in the book, I compare what I call two paradigms. One I call the gender paradigm, um, and then the other I call the Genesis paradigm. So one of the ways in which these two paradigms differ is in the view of language. So in the gender paradigm, which is very much a postmodernist, sometimes even I would say anti-realist paradigm, language is seen as actually creating reality. So all that we think of as knowledge, truth, reality is a construct ultimately of language. So language doesn't categorize or name what really exists, rather the categories we create, that's what makes our concept of what's real. Okay, so language creates reality rather than naming reality. And that's a very different vision than we get of language in the book of Genesis. So in, in Genesis, we have two kinds of speech. We have divine speech and we have human speech. So it's divine speech that creates, right? So God can create through words out of nothing, right? But human speech, we see this especially in the second creation account where you have the first human being, the Adam, who's... Um, naming the little creatures that God creates and brings to, to him to name. And so he sees what's what's before him, and then he chooses a name that expresses what that thing is, right? And none of the names that express what th that thing is also express that it's a suitable counterpart for him, right? But when he sees the woman for the first time, he says, at last, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman for out of man she was taken right so he he names her as something that is both like him and unlike him at the same time so the name he chooses reflects her nature right so that would be the pre-modern 
understanding of language. Um, so our language is true insofar as it corresponds to what exists. But in more of a postmodern, post-structuralist understanding, our language actually makes what's real. And as far as when that, <laughs> when that shift happens, Oh, have you read a secular age? <laughs> I mean, it's like, I, it's a, you know, it's hard to know like when exactly to jump into the story. Um, but I would say in the, in the switch, even into modernism, there's a shift from the objective world carrying its own meaning that is recognizable to us and that we receive meaning from the world. And that becomes inverted where, Rather, we, we project or we impose meaning onto the world. Um, and so then that shift carries even more into postmodernism, where language is really seen as this, as this vehicle of social construction. So in the genesis, in the gender paradigm, human speech basically takes the role of divine speech. And that's, that's kind of a common thread, basically, in that paradigm, because there is no creator human beings kind of take the role of the creator. And one of the aspects of that is the ability to construct reality through words. So I was going to bring this up actually at the end of the interview, but it just works so well now because I love that you brought up this example of Ish versus Isha, man and woman in, in Hebrew, um, because it really speaks, I mean, you speak so beautifully about this vision of complementarity um, which is very different from the way that I've seen a lot of people discuss gender difference. Usually people describe gender, even on the right, as difference, binary, rather than two things that are complementary. I guess, could you speak a little more to that? Right, that's a great question. Um, so I grew up evangelical, and the idea of complementarity or complementarianism was very much thrown around. And when I speak about complementarity now, I mean it in a different sense in a more Catholic sense. So I'll try to explain a little bit of the difference. So there's this wonderful philosopher named Prudence Allen, and she talks about how most theories of gender either fall into what she calls like a unisex position or a polarity position. So you can even trace this back to Plato and Aristotle. So Plato, for example, fundamentally has this unitary or neutral understanding of sexual difference. So he sees, you know, the sensible bodily world is not truly real. Um, so, but the soul is not sexed. And so he basically sees um, sex, he, he kind of leans more of a unisex view. Whereas Aristotle, he very much sees men and women not only as different, but actually almost as polar opposites or polarities. Um, and complementarity is this middle view. So it, it sees men and women as different, but also having equal dignity and being different in ways that are complementary or synergistic rather than polar opposites. I think that's the mistake that's made is that as soon as we begin to talk about sexual difference, too often it goes immediately to polarity. Like, well, you know, men, men are this way, which means women aren't that way and vice versa, right? So I think it's really important when we're talking about um, sexual difference that we keep of three dimensions um, in mind. So there's the human dimension. And in that sense, men and women are both fully human and they fully share in all the, the potentialities of being human, such as having a rational soul, et cetera. So both men and women are fully rational creatures. The whole range of human virtue is open to both sexes, for example. Then there is the realm of the dimension of sexual difference. So here we have asymmetry, but not necessarily polarity. So the differences are, are really rooted in bodily asymmetry, right? But they're not total opposites, but rather complements. And then we also have the level of the individual. So individuals can also, there's also variation, right? So often when we talk about differences between the sexes in terms of, say, temperament or disposition, we're talking in terms of averages. Well, not every individual is average, right? So I think a, a robust account of sexual difference need to, needs to take into account the human and the individual level as well. Um, to not reject difference, but also not to see men and women as these cartoonish opposites. Yeah. And I think, I mean, again, going back to the man, woman, ish, isha distinction, um, it's, it's like really beautiful that you sort of look at that. A lot of feminists, I think, say, oh, the word for woman contains the word for man. And it's like a sign of patriarchy. And you see in that complementarity, which I think 
it's I mean, it's interesting today because there's so many debates about what a woman is and what it means to be a woman. Um, and yeah, I think of the Matt Walsh documentary, which became very popular, which I think covers some similar ground to, to what you cover in your book. But it's almost used as comic relief, the fact that like no one can define woman without using the word woman. Well, I guess the most basic question is how do you define the word woman and why is it so hard for other people to do so? But furthermore, how does this vision of complementarity inform um, the way that we define womanhood? Hmm. Well, a, a woman, here's how I would define woman. A woman is the kind of human being whose body is organized according to the potential to gestate new life. And similarly, a man is a human being whose body is organized in um, the capacity to um, create life outside of himself, right? So um, it's rooted in generativity. Now, often the, the first objection we'll hear, but what about infertile couples or what about an infertile man? Is he not really a man because he doesn't, he's not able to impregnate a woman? And that's why the, the term potential here is so important, because even an infertile man, even that category of infertility signals an inherent potential that's being prevented from being actualized for some reason, right? So um, in fact, I was just having a conversation with a, with a woman this morning who has experienced infertility, and she talked about how relevant sex was in the entire process of being evaluated by a doctor and being diagnosed, right? So... Um, they, like when you, if you look at a typical man and you say, well, this man can't get pregnant, you wouldn't say he's then infertile, right? Uh, because his fertility doesn't depend on gestation. So even the very category of infertility, um, is dependent upon this distinction that I'm making. And I think the reason why we've forgotten this very basic human reality, um, is that we live in a time now where in our cultural imagination, we don't tend to think about our fertility very much, right? We live in a contraceptive culture. And I, I really think that that significantly changed how we think about manhood and womanhood. And it uprooted it from generativity. And it becomes much more about what we look like, what roles we play, what we appear to be, the kinds of things that we do, the kinds of tasks we perform. And so I think that we there's like this cultural f forgetting, really, that happened um, when it comes to, to generativity. We kind of move in, and act in the world as if the default mode is sterility and that fertility is kind of this, this add-on that you can, you can opt into it if you want. Um, so I would, I would at least point, I think there's much more to the story, you know, and I talk about this in my book, but I would say that I do think um, the advent of contraception has had a, a huge influence on this. Yeah, it's sort of an interesting historical trend because I think you kind of get the rise of these ideologies that erase gender differences at the same time as a lot of these technological advances um, were kind of, as you say, like imposing a norm of, inf of infertility. Um, what is it... I. It's sort of a, a basic question, but but do you have a view on if one was kind of pushing the other or causing the other to occur? Um, you know, they are so intertwined. That's what's fascinating. Um, when when we talk about gender, okay, so even just the, the term gender, the, the term gender identity, gender role, those were coined in um, the, the 50s by a psychologist and sexologist, John Money. And that was this at the same time that this concept of gender was being, and this term con, this term gender was being used in a new way. That's the same decade that the birth control pill is developed, which is the same technology um, of cross sex hormones that's used to manipulate the um, cosmetic appearance of the body. Right. That's those are the the synthetic hormones. Um, so that technology and that concept kind of gave, you know, arose at the same time. So I really think that these things reinforce reinforce one another for sure. Um, so that this conversation we're having about gender is deeply dependent upon these technological innovations that happen. And it's part of a larger story of the technological conquest of nature, um, which of course begins even prior to the 20th century. But in the 20th century, I would argue it's increasingly about technological conquest of human nature, right? So this, I think it's easy to kind of get 
bogged down too much into, say, the transgender debates and not see this as part of m more of a, of a broader transhumanist shift um, and, and a question about whether, for example, the medical profession should exist to restore or work with our nature or to actually push against its limits. And so I think even kind of within the ideological side of that, um, there is kind of a distinction where you have on the one hand, these kind of psychologists and sexologists like John Money, and you also have these postmodern theorists um, like Judith Butler. Um, and so I'm wondering, I know it's like a huge topic and you are a professor in this and it's hard to distill it down. Um, but I think that what you bring by having studied this so deeply, I, re I really want to dig into it a little bit. So in other interviews, you've talked about trickle down Butler, which I think is like such a pithy way of, of putting it. Um, but just to sort of, I guess, pick one amongst many to focus on Judith Butler quickly here. Um, how much of the way that we view gender now comes from Butler? And do people actually... I mean, understand her thought correctly is sort of a simplistic way of putting it. I guess maybe the better the better question would be like, are we at the end of the the tunnel with that? Like, have people kind of cracked the code on it, or um, is there more to be discovered? Right. So, so maybe I'll come at this question um, by by raising a contradiction that I see between Butler's at least her earlier works, which are more influential, and some of the more popular rhetoric around gender today. So um, I don't know, have you ever seen this, this like, it's not really a meme, but it's, it's like an illustration, like the gender bread person or the gender oh, yes. unicorn, right? <laughs> so they're, they're pretty common. Yeah. Either one will work, right? Um, but that, that image presents gender identity theory, what I usually call gender identity theory. And that locates manhood and womanhood or neither in the mind, basically, in one self-concept, right? So if you look at the image, there's like a brain, a little brain, and then an arrow pointing to it. And like, that's where your gender is. It's in the brain. It's in this self-concept. Now, that's a very different view from Judith Butler, right? So Judith Butler argued that gender is this socially compelled performance, that basically, as soon as we're born into the world, we internalize these scripts, these categories of girl, boy, man, woman, and then we reenact those scripts unconsciously, continually. And it's that performance that she says creates the illusion of an essence. So in, in Butler's theory, gender doesn't really exist, right? It's, it's an illusion. It's a performance that creates the illusion of something real. But this concept of gender identity, the way it's deployed now is very different. It's almost the way it's talked about is almost as if it's like a, like a gendered soul in a way. So for example, if you, if you hear that, um, oh, well, this, this boy, he really loves to play with my little ponies, you know, he, he's probably really a girl. Um, well, that idea that there's, that there's this real girlness inside this little boy that he can sense and that's even at odds with his socialization Right. So this that almost seems to present this kind of pre-social essence. And that's very different than the radical social constructionist of Judith Butler. So one of the questions that I've been wrestling with is like, well, how do you connect those two? Like those seem like completely different ideas. Well, I think what's happening here is that the the anti-realism of Judith Butler really served to displace sex um, in this conversation and put gender to the forefront. So Judith Butler was the first. Uh, what well, the first prominent, I guess, person, maybe the first, um, the first person in general, to argue that not only is gender a social construct, but sex itself, the category of sexual difference, that itself is also a social construct. Now that idea has really taken hold. So even the gender-bred unicorn people will say sex is just sex is a construct. The binary is a construct. Sex is really a spectrum. You know these concepts of male and female are overly simplistic. Um, so that that's where the anti-realism of Judith Butler is is still is um, is still alive and at work, right? But but what's interesting, I think, is that that anti-realism has paved the way for kind of a new realism or a new essentialism of gender identity um, to to take hold. And so what we're seeing is that gender has really kind of subsumed sex in our culture. So any words that used to be attached to sex, like female, male not even just man and woman, but female and male, right? Those are very biological terms. Those are now attached to gender rather than sex, 
right? So if I, if my self-concept is male, I'm male. Like that's not a biological question anymore, right? That's, that's seen as something. Um, so I think that's, that's what, what's happened here is that the anti-realism of Judith Butler has kind of cleared the deck in a way for this new essentialism. And I think part of that is that people, very few people are really hardcore anti-realists, right? I think Judith Butler has this kind of like rebellious, playful appeal, especially to college students. Like, yeah, gender is just performance. You know, it's not really real. Um, and I, when I've taught it to students before, they they really latch onto it. And I think it's because, of course, there's something very straightforwardly true about the fact that we perform our gender to a certain extent, right? We get, I get dolled up before I go on a date and that sort of thing. So young people will hear that and think, of course, yes, it's all a performance, right? But I don't, I think they don't often realize that she's not saying, oh, you express your gender. She's saying your gender doesn't exist. <laughs> gender doesn't exist. And what you're expressing is creating the illusion that something underlying that exists. But that's so counterintuitive to the way human beings think. Um, so I, I think there's this paradoxical anti-realism, but then has, has kind of pivoted to this new gender realism. But it's disembodied. It's disconnected from sex. Hmm. Um, one of the things that you say in your book about it is you say that a, a man can only imagine what it's like to be a woman. Um, given all that, I think there's been like a lot of imagination in pop culture about like what it actually means to be a man and means to be a woman. Um, there's a lot of complaints about it relying on stereotyping and such. What do you think the differences are uh, between kind of like the popular imagination about masculinity versus femininity. Because it seems to me that, I mean, obviously you can define male and female in a biological sense, but I think that there is kind of a spiritual sense that people feel that there is actually kind of difference in, in personality or something between male and female. Um, how do you think about that question? Right. Well, I think, I think that it's really rooted in the body and it's important to realize too, that, sex is sex is about the structure of the body as a whole it's not about parts okay it's about the whole and that's also something that i think is is missed in these conversations that people too often reduce sex to genitalia um, when it's about the organization of all of our organ systems yes the reproductive system but sex affects all of our bodily systems not just the reproductive system as a catholic i'm working from an anthropology of body soul unity, right? So maleness, femaleness, manhood and womanhood is grounded in the body. But because we are spiritual bodily beings, there is a spiritual component to it, right? There is a spiritual expression of it. Um, it's not, there, there's not this kind of dualistic, like my, like the Platonic idea, right? Like that my, my, my mind isn't sexed or my brain isn't sex, what my body is, right? Um, now, as far as like really nitty gritty questions about whether the soul is sex, like that's, that's an interesting question that I don't, I, I'm still chewing on it. Um, but I, I guess I'm drawn more toward, so Edith Stein seems to think that, I don't know if she would put it as strongly as that the soul has a sex, but rather that the unity of the body and soul in this life is so profound that there is a sense in which the body inflects our soul, right? And even, I mean, even when you, when you read, like, say, Bernard of Clairvaux, and he talks about the the soul in heaven that's longing for its body, like longing for this fullness that will only come with the resurrection. Um, and and also, if you think about the way we um, can, you know, pray to to saints now and appeal to saints and um, revere them to a certain extent, it's strange for me to think that you know, Edith Stein isn't, you know, a woman <laughs> right now, even though she's also awaiting the resurrection. So I do think there's something profoundly important um, about, it's not just relegated to the body. Um, but I also resist the idea, again, this kind of polarity idea that men and women are are these opposites. So I think it's it's totally fair to be able to talk about the sexes in terms of averages and generalities. And I think that can be a helpful conversation as long as we also don't lose sight of the fact that there are individuals who will not necessarily reflect the average, right? So 
In other words, if you kind of picture a bimodal graph, um, there's a good deal of overlap between men and women when it comes to things, say, like personality or temperament or likes, dislikes, that sort of thing. Um, but what really sets us apart is our is our embodiment. I guess, uh, I mean, the question that I really want to ask is how did we get here? I mean, like just sort of more detail about um, kind of the intellectual route. You know, we've talked about Judith Butler, but I guess kind of more broadly. Um, I don't know if that's like a fair question because this is like an entire academic field of study. Um, so I guess the angle that i be curious if you could approach this from um, when you kind of were in the process of teaching gender theory to students. Um, what was it for you? Like what kind of like specific issues or thinkers were the ones who kind of made you think about some of these inconsistencies um, in the prevailing narrative? Well, I would say I was blind to the inconsistencies for a long time. Um, but where, where I see some of the, the gaps or inconsistencies now, so feminist thought has always had an allergy to essentialism, right? So essentialism, um, and I don't even mean like a hardcore Aristotelian essentialism here. I just mean essentialism in feminist thought, which is much more general than that. And it's basically the idea that men and women are different in essence. They're essentially different in some way. So since the second wave, feminist thought has been very anti-essentialist and much more nominalist, right? So yes, we can talk about women, but it's really much more of a nominal category that we create rather than something that actually reflects um, a difference in, in nature. And that, I think, creates a tension in feminist thought itself because feminism exists to defend or advocate for women, even while it simultaneously is very uneasy with asserting what a woman is with any real um, confidence. Okay. And so I think that that nominalist urge, that, an that anti-essentialist urge, and there are plenty of bad versions of essentialism, right? That I think feminism could have easily critiqued those rather than almost disregarding the idea of sexual difference, innate sexual difference altogether. And I think what that has created, that kind of, that gap has really expanded to now where you have feminists who, who are basically applauding the idea that a man can say he's a woman and that that statement simply by fiat is true, right? So now you have feminism basically sawing off the branch that it's sitting on. So I do think that there, there's almost this ironic discomfort in feminism toward femaleness as well. Um, so those are some of the inconsistencies I would see. And especially again, since the second wave onward, um, like freedom for women looks like um, making themselves physiologically speaking as much like men as possible through contraception, through abortion. So women's fertility is seen as a threat. It's often pathologized. Um, so Again, that's this kind of ironic discomfort with femaleness for a movement that's supposed to be um, kind of defending women who, people who are female. Um, and I would also say some other inconsistencies. I mean, one of the ones that drives me nuts right now is that you will hear this constant equivocation about what gender is. So people will say gender is a social construct. And then in the very next sentence say that, you know, gender is one sense of self as a woman or man or both or neither, right? Well, those, again, like I said, those two concepts are intention. Like, is gender this pre-social innate identity or is it a construct of society? Like those are, those are different ideas, right? But we use the term gender to name both of them. Um, and also I see, again, another, another example of equivocation is that there are times when feminist thought doubles down on the reality of sex, often say like in debates about abortion, suddenly there we can talk about women and connect it to femaleness when it, you know, um, when it comes to abortion. Or for example, the idea of sexual orientation, um, that's very much in tension with the concept of gender identity that's not attached to sex. So what is it, for example, this is something I would ask my students, like what does it, if sex is assigned at birth, 
And how can you be born gay? Like, how can you be born with an innate attraction to something that is not itself innate? Right. So there's once you start looking at the, you know, a, a little bit closer, there are so many tensions and inconsistencies. And a lot of it has to do with just the way that gender and sex have become such confused terms. And so there's so much equivocation and so much contradiction and rhetorical, you know, just kind of sophistry that happens constantly. How did students respond to that question out of curiosity? Oh, that was a great moment. That was a great teaching <laughs> moment because that stumped them. They were like, oh. you know, that was one of those moments where they were like, oh. You know? <laughs> and of course, I mean, this this is a very real debate within what is often called the LGBT community, right? As if it's just this monolith. Um, but, you know, there are some people who will argue that lesbians who don't want to sleep with trans women, so men who identify as women, are transphobic. Right? So um, that's, a, you know, there is a real tension between those two concepts. Like, what does, what does it mean to be, when I say that I'm attracted to men, does that, am I attracted to a, an embodiment of a person? Am I attracted to someone's self-concept? How could I be attracted to someone's self-concept if I've never even had a conversation with that person, right? Like, um, so these concepts really are, are in tension with one another. Mm. And you, you talk, talked a little bit about this. I want to dig into it a little bit more. Um, but this um, idea that feminism has kind of adopted male norms of sexuality and fertility for women and for everyone. Um, I, I'm really interested by that because I feel like if I like, took a time machine back, it's not necessarily a direction that I would have expected the feminist movement to have taken. Um, and I think, you know, I think there are corners of the internet that would maybe claim that Christianity demands the opposite by asking men to be monogamous that, you know, that's also kind of been in the news recently as well. Um, but I guess, um, yeah, how, how do you, how do you get to that point where, and yeah, and how do people justify it? Right. So, I mean, I think you're right that I mean, one of the reasons why women flock to Christianity in, in the early days of Christianity is that it offered them much more freedom than Roman society, right? So it was very, there's this famous, there's this, I don't know if it's famous, actually, it might be obscure. There's this sermon by Augustine where he talks about how, guess what, men, if you commit it, you can commit adultery too. Like it's not just women who can commit adultery, but actually men have to, to have sexual fidelity as well. And that was hugely controversial because that was not the norm um, in, in Roman society. So the fact that Christianity has this, this ethic of chastity, this ethic of sexual moderation and control, um, that does that that calls on virtue and also supernatural help to allow people of both sexes, but certainly men as well, um, to practice continence. So that was more or less, I would say, the prominent view in first wave feminism. So when first wave feminists would talk about the need, the, the need to, at times, regulate births, the mechanism for that regulation was male virtue. The mechanism was to recognize marital rape as rape, right? Um, so it wasn't to change women's bodies. It was to call men to a higher standard of behavior. And that really shifted, I think, with the birth control movement. So you also had Margaret Sanger, who was the founder of the, the birth control movement, and she didn't like she didn't like the first wave feminists because they didn't go far enough. And if you read Margaret Sanger's work, it's really striking how much she scapegoats female fertility for everything that's wrong with the world. Tyranny, poverty, famine, everything. It's all because women keep having babies. And for her, you know, it's not even so much about like freedom. It's almost like we have, you know, there's this moral imperative that women have to, you know, end this suffering they're causing by the fact that they have babies. So she really scapegoats the female body. And her, her movement is incredibly popular. So when she first begins, she's, you know, she's a eugenicist. She's also pro-birth control. Well, eugenics was very popular when she started out. It's very socially acceptable, whereas birth control was not. Um, but she almost, you know, I would say single-handedly reshaped the public perception of contraception. And then of course was, um, behind the, the development of the birth control pill and the, 
in the 1950s. And then, of course, once once that philosophy then becomes technologically manifest, then it's like it becomes entrenched in society, right? So we now all inherit that and we actually have changed our bodies to fall in line with that, with that philosophy. And so I think that's, it's, they're both together, right? You almost can't separate them. Um, and even for Sanger, her philosophy was always connected to this like ten- technological intervention, right? It was, no, we change our bodies. We have to change our nature. It's not about practicing continence. It's not about virtue. It's about physiologically disrupting women's bodies. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's when the, the, the implicit masculine norm, I think became entrenched. And you also see this on the philosophical side in Simone de Beauvoir's book, A Second Sex, which I really think is, you know, it's, it's influence can't be underestimated in terms of the development of second wave feminism in the West. And she is, she's, you, you read that book and you come up with the impression that she just does not like being female, you know? So the way she writes about femaleness is that, you know, women are more enslaved to the species. We're more animal like, and, you know, she's working within this existentialist framework where we create meaning by transcending the brute facts of our existence. But because women are more tied to our animal existence, we basically have to work harder and work against our, our physicality in a way that men don't. But for her, the norm is always implicitly male, you know, and it's I don't and sometimes explicitly. I mean, the last line of her 800 page tome is about men and women together reclaiming their brotherhood, their fraternité. You know, it's not their partnership, right? It's brotherhood. It's, it's adopting women into the brotherhood. Yeah. I mean, it strikes me that like even now, so many of our measures of success are, I mean, despite everything that, you know, the course of history of feminism and all these various waves have done, our measures of success still are, you know, very masculine. And that's part of what influences um, that kind of like, I totally empathize with like that jealousy from Simone de Beauvoir, because there's just certain measures of career success or what have you that tend to be very dominated by men and do really trade off with having kids. Right, right. It, it, and those problems are the, the, so the chapter that I really love in the second sex is called The Independent Woman. And in that she describes how basically in modern society, women are expected to be both perfect men and perfect women. And she is so right about that, right? So it's this double burden that that women are placed, that is placed upon women. But I, you know, I, I disagree with her solution to that, which is, you know, basically a Marxist revolution and contraception, abortion, and then some other people raising the kids because who has time for that? We've got books to write, you know? So I don't agree with her solution, but that that tension of the independent woman, that predicament of the modern woman is very much real. Yeah. Feminism was never like quite willing to give up on like the the sort of glories of, of masculine success. Right. It's interesting to me also in your book, you you drew out this difference that I didn't actually know about um, between French and Anglo feminists. Um, and I just like, because I don't know who I would ever be able to ask about this, but you, you're the first person I know who's mentioned it. Um, but those two worlds, uh, it seems to me that you were drawn more to the French feminists because they kind of celebrated some of these sex differences in a way that some of the Anglo feminists did not. Is this or was this like an actual cross-cultural debate happening in feminism or were these two kind of ideas about femininity working totally independently in different language zones or what's the interaction there? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, so I think when I when I talk about French feminism, I'm kind of talking about this, the the big the chief kind of three or four French feminists who are writing in the 80s and 90s. Um, so Hélène Sixou, Lucie Rigueray, Julia Kristeva, Monique Wittig, and I. My work in in graduate school has focused primarily on Lucie Rigueray, but also Sixou. So they, what I liked about them, and I think what I was drawn to about them is that they are they are very positive about difference and they are very positive about the female body, right? So Ellen Sixou has this whole like feminine writing thing, la creature feminine, where you let the female body break into writing, right? So she kind of talks about the, 
um, the kind of drives and excesses of the female body and how that can sort of change the way that we write. And, and I think a lot of it has to do with actually psychoanalytic influence. So Jacques Lacan, especially, who is totally mind numbing to read, don't recommend that to anyone, but nonetheless, I think that it, that was a, a very much an influence in, um, in that strand, that strain of French feminist thought and psychoanalysis does take the body seriously, right? So it takes the, the drives of the body, um, and that, that, that has an impact on our consciousness in a certain way. And so I think that the French feminists allowed the, the body to break into their, to their work more. And, but Lucie Rigre was the, my primary focus and her philosophy is basically the space where she says she, she looks at all of Western philosophy and she says, the problem is that what a woman is or like subjectivity in the feminine has never really been thought. So woman has only been defined in reference to maleness. So we've only been thinking in terms of oneness and sameness. And what we need to do is to think in terms of two-ness. We need to think in terms of, of difference, um, the difference of the two. And so she seems to be getting at this idea of, you know, integral complementarity that you hear in some Catholic philosophy, that men and women as being these complete holistic beings unto themselves, but yet they're, that difference, cre you know, creates this um, possibility of creativity and collaboration between them. Um, but if we just think about a woman as a deformed male, then we haven't really thought in terms of two, we, we're still only thinking in terms of one. I think she's totally right about that. And what I think is ironic now is that just when we're beginning to think in terms of the two, we suddenly veer off course even further. And now, now that's transphobic, right? So Lucia Rigore is not, is, has totally fallen out of favor because, you know, she's too binary um, and she's too rooted in the body. So there's like this, this like moment when, you know, Western philosophy might begin to really think about human subjectivity in terms of two rather than one. And instead we let that remain unthought. So even now as a Catholic, I'm like, she's great. <laughs> yeah. I think over the course of this conversation, uh, we've talked so much about kind of the body and the link between the body and the soul. Um, and it's something that I, I think you deal very, I mean, I, I might even say uniquely in your book, um, because you talk about, I think your exact words are bodies revealing personhood. Um, and to me, that struck me immediately as like this very medieval idea. Um, and in fact, one that we're, I think, taught growing up is like this very primitive idea. We're taught that like what you look like doesn't have anything to do with like what's inside and um, that these medieval ideas that like, if you're ugly, it means you're a bad person. Like that's all that it is. And it's all ridiculous. Um, so I guess talk to me a little bit more about this, about this like link between the body and the soul. Okay. So defend it, I guess, against that critique. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, let me start out by saying, I'm not saying that like, if you're ugly, you're a bad person. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think anyone actually thinks sure. that. But like when we were taught about like the Middle Ages in my middle school history class, that's essentially like what we were told people thought at the time. And I'm susp suspicious that you don't believe that. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I mean, this this isn't like my original idea. Um, I'm I encountered it first in John Paul II's theology of the body. So he talks about the the body as having sacramental meaning. And so basically he's saying that there's this hidden reality of our personhood that can only ma be made visible through the frame of our embodiment, right? So our interaction right now, the very fact that I'm somehow, you know, imperfectly, but nonetheless trying to give you access to my thoughts, I'm only able to do that through my voice, right? Through the fact that you can hear me or see me, you can sense me in a certain way. And so in that way, the body forms a sacramental function. It makes visible what is invisible, right? So this is the sacramentality of the body, of course, is, is fulfilled most fully in Christ, who is, who is the, the body that makes present and visible and tangible the invisible God, right? But there's a similar way in which that is true, um, that we have that to be a human being is to, to be a spiritual reality that is made that is made manifest through the body. But what's interesting, I think, what I see 
in, in our society right now is a desire for the body to reveal the person. But the error is in thinking that the body isn't already doing that, but rather the body must be made to do that, right? The bo- I'm, I must force my body in some way to express who I really am. And of course, that's, you know, maybe most obvious in a, in kind of a medical transition, but I, I mean it even just in terms of like, you know, Instagram posts and filters or even like fashion or how, you know, and there's a certain way in which, um, you know, trying to express the beauty of the body, there's nothing wrong with that. But when it becomes this project, when it becomes this, um, when the, when the body is seen as not carrying its own intrinsic meaning, but rather it must be made meaningful. It must be inscribed with meaning. That's where I think we, we fall into this error again of thinking that meaning must be constructed. We, we don't receive meaning. Our body isn't a gift. Creation isn't a gift, but rather we have to create it. We can't just receive it. Yeah, that's really true. Um, and I think especially like we're just so surrounded by advertisements and such and, and all this pressure to be like, if you buy this one kind of product, you know, like that's what it means to actually be you. It's really, really pernicious. I think you're right, even beyond all the gender stuff. Um, so sort of moving moving towards the end of this interview here, um, you talk in your book about kind of the process of teaching of teaching gender theory to students. Um, and one of the things you say about it that I thought was so interesting uh, was that now that the work of disorientation without any effort at reorientation began to unsettle me. And I think that's a, a very interesting kind of critique of our education system, like as a whole, um, even beyond, I think gender theory in particular tries to kind of disorient. But I think just in general, there is that kind of push uh, throughout our education system in that direction. Uh, so I guess my question would be like, how, when you are teaching, like, do you actually reorient um, because it strikes me that part of the problem is that disorientation is actually like quite a bit easier. Oh yeah, it's, it's much <laughs> easier. It's so much more fun to deconstruct than it is to be constructive, right? And academia is maybe the wor- <laughs> worst about this. And I mean, if you've ever been in a faculty meeting, you know, it's just like, okay, let's talk about like the 10 things wrong with this idea. And oh, we're out of time, you know? So or, or this value of like critical thinking as if that's sort of the ultimate goal of education. We just, we just want students to think critically, like to what end, right? So, I mean, basically that disorientation, reorientation is, is calling back to the idea of ends, to the idea of a telos, to like, there's, there has to be a point, there has to be a destination that, that we're journeying towards. And certainly if you're, you know, in a religious context, right? So it, it, you know, teaching in a religious context, it would, it's really about not just searching for what's not true, but really seeking truth. Um, and actually that's true, not just in a religious context. So that I think is the difference. So not just about picking apart ideas, not just about being able to critique, but actually being able to propose, um, being able to build, being able to, to see what's true not just what's problematic, right? That's sort of like the buzzword of today. Ooh, that's problematic. Well, that can't be the end of an education to be able to point out what's problematic. Um, it has to be more than that. So I do think that in general, education in the West has has lost a sense of telos, um, has lost a sense that we're, we're journeying toward a particular destination or, or a fulfillment or a fullness um, of truth, goodness, beauty, uh, but that's what it's all about, you know, and, you know, if it's, if it's just critical thinking, well, then to hell with it. Well, this has been super interesting. Thank you so much, Abigail, for taking the time. Really, really enjoyed chatting with you. Yeah, this is great. Thanks for having me. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. Abigail Favale, lending Christian perspectives on gender and feminism. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to follow, subscribe, and leave us a review. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram and find out more about what we do at jmp.princeton.edu. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll catch you next time here on Madison's Notes. Madison's Notes.